can't figure out how to get the team to score. That'd be awesome. Well, you might blow off. You might blow people off. Huh? You know what I'm saying? They're already going to get in the hot. You know what I'm saying? We need to make it worse. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got about three minutes till we start. If you would take your seats, because we're going to start it right on time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good to see you. Is Bruce here? Bruce. Uh, yeah, we got extra seats. With what? With what? Just till you speak. Hey, oh, hey. Hey. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's six o'clock. Uh, Representative Salzman is going to get sorted out, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Now that she's here, we can get started. First and foremost, thank each and every one of you for being out here tonight. I appreciate your time. I know everyone's got a lot to do. Uh, this is a great community, and I'm, I'm very, very thankful that you're here. I look forward to hearing from you. Um, at this time, I would typically offer an opening prayer. However, my friend who does this for a living is here tonight, Pastor Gordon Godfrey, and I've already spoke with him. He's going to bring us our invocation. Please join us. Please stand. All right, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you tonight that we can meet together in a free country and discuss the will for this community, what you want, what's best for this place. So we pray that you'd lead us and guide us in all that's said and done. And Lord, give us wisdom to know how to deal with the issues that are confronting us and the things that we need to do and the things that we don't need to do. Lord, help us to say those things that are important and to leave unsaid those things that are not. And we pray for your wisdom and guidance tonight. Bless each one that's here, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Please remain standing as we do the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, uh, thanks again. As I said, thank you for being here. I'm just going to open with some brief remarks before I introduce the staff that's here. We have um, all, a lot of staff members here, all the ones that can answer all your questions. We also have uh, an assortment of elected officials, so we appreciate all of their participation tonight. Each of them are going to be given the opportunity to address you and um, you know, give you some remarks. Some housekeeping to get started. Um, there are water fountains in the back. If you need to use a restroom, go out those doors to the left. There's restrooms back there. I'm going to try and keep this to an hour, but that's up to you. I'll stay as late as, uh, as they allow me to before they kick me out. And I, again, as I said before, I look forward to hearing uh, from each and every one of you. Our uh, administrator, Wes Marino, unfortunately, uh, at the last minute, had to bow out. He's not, he's not feeling well. He's under the weather. But his replacement is here tonight. Debbie Bowers is here. So I'm going to ask her to come up, bring some remarks, and to introduce the staff that's present. Debbie, thanks for being here. Oh, you can tell from here that so many people showed up. Thank you so much for showing up. 
Uh, we're all excited about some of the things that are going on in this district. So we have with us uh, the Director of Public Works, Jamie Higdon. We have the Director of our Development Services, which includes the planning, uh, Horace Jones. We have the Director of Engineering, Joy Jones. I mean, Joy Jones, I'm sorry, Joy Blackman. <laughs> Excuse me so much. Uh, then we have next to her, uh, Drew Homer. He's in our Development Services Department, as is John Fisher. Uh, Tyler Davison is the Deputy Director of uh, Public Works. And then we have our Transportation Engineer, Chris Phillips. Um, and I think that's everybody. Okay. okay. Thank right. you. Short and sweet. I like it. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go ahead and introduce some other folks that are here today, um, our other elected officials. So um, in no particular order, but we're always going to start with the most important one. Sorry, Michelle. Uh, Chip Simmons, our sheriff, is here. Welcome him. <laughs> Chief Deputy Andrew Hobbs is here as well. Thank you, Andy. The one and only Representative Michelle Salzman is here. Welcome, Michelle. My friend Kevin Adams is here from the school board. Welcome, Kevin. My friend Vicki Campbell from ECUA District 1 is here. as is Bruce Woody, who is the Executive Director of ECUA. So he'll be here, we'll be giving some remarks tonight about recycling and some other topics. And uh, finally, I wanna say thank you to the school board and to the staff of Beulah Middle School for letting us use this facility. We had initially planned on um, doing this at a different venue. Unfortunately, that, that um, uh, offer was withdrawn. So we went ahead and, and we moved down here, which is fine. This is a beautiful facility as well. So we're gonna start out, Chip, I, we spoke, nope, you're good? You're good, okay. All right, Michelle Salzman, are you good? No, come on down, give some remarks. <laughs> Welcome, Michelle Salzman. Okay, okay I, I don't know how the sheriff got away with that, maybe because he's uh, open carry and I don't know. Oh, oh, because he showed up early. Well, I have a constituent service day on June 20th. We'll have every agency, um, including the commissioner here, he'll have some folks here at Beulah Church on um, June the 20th from 1 to 3. So if you have any issues at all, any at all, state, federal, local, veterans, anything, we will have people from every agency there to address your concerns. And if they don't address them, then they will be um, instructed to make sure that they give you follow-up. And if they don't follow up, you call me and let me know. But I'm just here to listen tonight and see the concerns and see how I can support you guys. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much. Next up, Kevin Adams, Escambia County School Board. Kevin. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Hello, everybody. One day I want to thank everybody in this room. Y'all all have paid a one half cent sales tax that builds facilities like this. We just, I just went yesterday, our grand opening at uh, for the new Pleasant Grove Elementary. Beautiful place, you know, beautiful school. Very efficient, don't take a lot of utilities like some of the older schools do. So uh, appreciate what y'all do. Um, I hope I do have another new school, maybe on OLF 8. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. But uh, so anyway, thank you for being here tonight. And if you have any questions, you just let me know. Thank you very much, Kevin. All right, next up, uh, Vicki, do you want to go first or Bruce? I'll, I'll go. Okay, all right. Vicki Campbell from the ECUA. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Commissioner Bergash, for having us here. And like you said, Bruce is with me, so we'll be here to answer questions later. I'm going to give you a real quick update on uh, sanitation and recycle, where we're going this, this summer. And, uh, and then Bruce can tell you what projects we have coming in this area uh, this summer. And then if you have questions, we'll just stick around so you can ask us all your questions later. And if he gets questions that we didn't get to answer up here, uh, he can send them to us with your email address and we'll answer those. So. Um, if you have a neighborhood or a watch group or anywhere you'd like us to come and speak, we are more than happy to do that. I'm going to give you the quick update on yard waste, uh, sanitation, and recycle. Starting with yard waste, uh, it's that time of year, so please keep your piles six feet by six feet. Uh, and everybody's cleaning their yard. The purpose of our yard waste program is for your normal clippings and pruning and whatever. It's not for if you cut down a tree. Unfortunately, some of the tree companies are telling people, I can cut down your tree and I have to charge you this much to move it away. 
but if uh, you just put it to the street, ECUA will come do that for free, and that's not true. The county actually has an ordinance that says if a contractor takes away a tree, he has to take away the, I mean, takes down a tree, he has to take away the tree. So um, if we miss your yard waste or pickup, or customer service doesn't respond, you can email or text me. My cards will be on this back table with some other information that we have, including some yard bags for that um, yard waste pickup. N next, we'll talk about bulk waste pickup. So you've always been used to us just coming around by your house, and if you have bulk waste, we pick it up, right? Fuel has gotten so expensive that for us just to drive around and pick up waste everywhere, that's wasting fuel because half the time whole neighborhoods don't even have a pickup. So now we are going to move July 1st. We've had this in our flyers. We've had it on the news. We've had it at Rotary Clubs. We've been talking about it everywhere, but still people are not going to know it's happening. So if you're a member of a civic organization, remind them July the 1st, bulk waste is still here, still free, but it's only if you call, okay? So call. Call before 2 o'clock, the day before your pickup, and we will pick it up on the same day as your normal pickup. So it's still free, it's still there. But we're just not going to waste a lot of fuel that you have to pay for to go around and pick it up. Be sure to let your HOA, church, and Neighborhood Watch people know all about that. Recycle will commence again on July the 12th. We've had a very bad issue with temporary labor. Um, hope to get that resolved and everything back open by July the 12th. Recycle is not a money maker. Again, I tell you this every time I come here, it's cost avoidance. Recycle right. You hear me say that a lot more in the coming year. I love that you have these little cards tonight because I'm going to ask you just to pick up the one that says, I agree that I want to recycle. I agree. Okay, I love that. That's, that's, whoo, that's like, ooh, that's more than I expected. Okay, now if you if you want to recycle, I'm going to ask you that you recycle right, and I'm going to tell you what that means. If you want to recycle right, but you don't know how to recycle, if you're not sure how to recycle, hold up that agree. Oh, my gosh, these people are great. I love Beulah. I married a boy from Beulah, by the way. Um, so if you, if you just don't want to recycle, let me give my friend a call. Oh boy. If you don't want to recycle, uh, hold up the, I agree. I know he doesn't like recycling. <laughs> I, I That's okay. My, I, my husband is not a good recycler. So you know what I tell him? Honey, just put everything in the garbage can. So that's what I'm going to tell anybody in this room tonight. If you don't know how to recycle and you don't want to recycle right, do me a favor and throw it in the garbage can. Recycle contamination is the biggest problem in the United States of America right now. I read a story about Dallas yesterday, and they're having the same issues that we're having here. Escambia County and Pensacola have more contamination than anybody else we recycle for. Pensacola and Escambia County have more contamination than any place we recycle for. Over 50% of the stuff put in the recycle can is not recycled. So, just a brief history real quick. I know Jeff that wants me to shut up. County had drop-off places for recycle, and recycle was taken there. The League of Women Voters and LEAP group decided that we should be recycling. So they put these little blue cans everywhere in, Pens in Escambia County. In 2007, the court case came down that said flow control. Every county can say we, that every sanitation company has to put it in the county landfill. So we can't get a better price anywhere else. We have to put everything at the landfill. The landfill, not under Jeff Bergosh, this was way before Jeff Bergosh got here, went up to $45 a ton. And that's when those tipping fees got so high, we decided, hey, we need to do something. Let's start Recycle. So Recycle is a lot cheaper. Again, it's not a money maker. it's a cost avoidance. We avoid that $45 a ton. They don't mind because they, they get plenty of trash, right? They get a lot of trash. They get a lot of trash. So you don't have to recycle. It's a voluntary program. If you want to recycle, all we ask is that you recycle right. We have now an app for your cell phone that's called the Recycle Coach. You can go on that app and find out exactly what you can and can't recycle. We'll play a little game real quick, and then I'm going to leave, and he's going to be very happy. Hold up your little card if you agree that cardboard boxes can be recycled. Very good. 
Hold up your little card. You agree if pizza boxes can be recycled? If Very good. If they're clean, they can be recycled. What pizza box is clean? Not many. Not many are clean. So if they don't have the little paper in the bottom, and most of the people don't want to spend that money anymore. Uh, can we, and the people in Perdido love when I ask this, wine bottles, can we recycle them? Yes, we can. We recycle glass. And we're one of the few people that do that, few companies that do that. Aluminum cans. Of course. Absolutely. That's your favorite. Milk, that's the favorite. Milk or tea plastic jugs. Yes, if they're clean. Milk or orange juice cartons? No, we cannot. If they're slick, if they're the slick cardboard uh, paper on the outside, they cannot be recycled. Garden hoses? No. Very good. Clothes? No. Paint? No. Batteries? No. no. Okay, thank you. For a full list of those recyclables, <laughs> go, go on that Recycle Coach app. And it will tell you, it will tickle you when it's time to put the garbage out. So, because, you know, I forget. My husband, I, I love him. He, we've been married 30 years this month. He never forgets to put the garbage out. He goes out of town for a golf tournament. And what is the first thing I do? I forget to put out the garbage. So, <laughs> thank you very much for your time. If you ever have a missed pickup, you ever need me for water, sewer, or garbage, just take a card back here and everybody will tell you I will return 100% of my phone calls. Thank Bruce you. is going to tell you just three or four capital improvement projects we got going on right now in this area. Speaking of that list, if you want to know what can be recycled and what can't, there's a table over there that has refrigerator magnets on it and has a real nice little list of kind of uh, coach you through, through uh, what you can and can't recycle. There's also some uh, other information about uh, ECUA, our water quality report and some uh, compost bags as well, if you're interested. Real quick, uh, rundown about four projects. Out here, Beulah has been growing like crazy. We've added uh, 1,600 water customers and 1,700 wastewater customers uh, in last year. In far and away, the majority of those have been uh, here out west. So we're working on a couple projects regarding uh, drinking water uh, in response to that growth. We have a proposed uh, new water well in Beulah, where we're currently doing a test well over on uh, Divine Farms Road, just on the east side of I-10. Um, and we also have a Beulah transmission main proposed to run from 297A along Divine Farms Road uh, west, underneath the interstate, over to Frank Reader Road, and then on over to Beulah Road. It'll also have a T where there'll be a transmission that'll, main that'll come down through uh, OLF 8 uh, back to Nine Mile to create a loop. So there's a couple of projects we're working on uh, on the subject of uh, drinking water in our area. We also have some coordination projects. Um, item 2D on your agenda talks a little bit about some FDOT projects. Uh, we're gonna be redoing or uh, relocating a 12-inch water main at the intersection of uh, Nine Mile and I-10 uh, in the fairly near future, probably this winter. And then uh, a couple years from now, we'll, we'll be working with uh, FDOT when they redo the intersection of Pine Forest and I-10 as well. Uh, on that project, we'll also be updating and increasing the size of some of our water mains in that particular area. Lastly, uh, we're working on a transfer station for our uh, sanitation division, uh, following along the idea of efficiency. And it's a long drive from downtown all the way out to uh, Perdita Landfill. So in order to shortcut the number of trucks that are making that long distance uh, trek, we're gonna have, uh, we're, we're currently in design for a transfer station that'd be located uh, where our current operations are uh, at, at the intersection of Pine Forest just, uh, and uh, Godwood Lane, which right across from the Walmart grocery store there. Uh, we've designed a very small footprint uh, location has four compactors, there's no, there's direct transfer without any open handling. So it'll be out of sight, out of mind, but we'll provide some wonderful efficiencies in terms of not having as many trucks going to the landfill and not having the, the damage to uh, vehicles uh, like we usually have to deal with otherwise. Uh, again, reminder, there's some uh, good information over there at the table. And uh, I do have a question from Mr. Philip Fiorelli regarding fire hydrants. I have your phone number, so I'll call you and talk to you directly about that. Thank you. All right, Bruce, thank you very much.
Well, I certainly do appreciate all the elected officials showing up tonight and the appointed officials as well and the information that we're bringing forward. One of the, one of the biggest issues that I get emails and phone calls and Facebook messages about is transportation. And we're surrounded by state roads out here, Nine Mile Road, Beulah Road from Mobile Highway all the way up to where we're building the interchange, um, of course, Interstate 10. Um, uh, but we are, there are a number of big projects underway. And so our director of traffic, our traffic engineer, Chris Phillips, is here tonight. And Chris, I'd like to bring him forward to just bring you up to speed on some big projects that are underway right now or that are in the works. So um, please, please help me welcome Chris Phillips. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. I'm just going to go through. I ended up with about two pages worth. Um, not all of them are in the Beulah area, so we'll stick to the Beulah area. We'll start with the Mobile Highway resurfacing, and that's from Nine Mile Road to Pine Forest Road. Uh, that project is about half complete. Um, it is a, a DOT project, and part of that project is also going to include a traffic signal at Klondike and Mobile Highway. So I think it, everybody that lives on Klondike will be very pleased with that. Um, Frank Reeder uh, Road Widening, that is a county project, uh, Frank Reeder Road that runs along the north side of OLF8. Uh, we are expecting 30% design documents uh, due back to the office next month with 100% design documents uh, due in January of 2024. And what we're doing there is we're adding turn lanes uh, along Frank Reeder Road at the Frank Reeder uh, Beulah Road inter intersection. Uh, there will be additional turn lanes in all directions there. Uh, there will be uh, a multi-use path along Frank Reader Road as well as a con continuation of sidewalks and drainage considerations as well. Um, Interstate Circle Bridge, that many of you may not even know where that bridge is, but it's a uh, bridge on Interstate Circle that is immediately south of the interstate. Um, we partnered with uh, the DOT on a 75-25 agreement. So that they could rebuild that bridge to help with flow underneath the interstate. Um, and we expect that construction, uh, the design is underway and the construction will be in, begin in February of 2026. Um, another project, the Pine Forest Road westbound off-ramp lengthening. So if you travel I-10 in the Pine Forest area during the fair, you know that traffic always backs up on I-10 during that season. Um, so the DOT has uh, completed the design for that. Uh, but unfortunately, there's no construction funding yet in the five-year work program. But as, as construction projects shift around, sometimes they can find the money to, to kind of move those things up. So we've definitely not lost any hope for that one. Um, so Beulah Road is now a state road. So the DOT has uh, Beulah Road uh, resurfacing from Mobile Highway all the way up to Isaacs Lane, where, the, where it begins the curve to just go over the interstate. Um, that design is underway right now, and they expect the design to be completed uh, this coming up April in 2024, and construction to begin in, in 2025. And it's my understanding that they're also looking heavily at the uh, intersection here with Nine Mile Road. Tell them about the interview. So, uh, unfortunately, there was a fatality there uh, some weeks ago. And we were able to, we had, had mentioned to DOT some concerns that we had before. When the fatality happened, we were able to provide uh, DOT with some recommendations. And to their credit, they immediately jumped on looking at um, some improvements to that intersection. Our recommendation was if you're on Nine Mile Road and you're wanting to turn left in either direction on Beulah, right now you have a per, what's called a permissive left. So you don't have to have the green arrow to make the left. I think the problem is the way that intersection is oriented, it's kind of tough to see oncoming traffic. And so if we go to protected lefts only, certainly that will increase the safety there. It may delay time a little bit, but I think we can all stand to wait a little bit instead of you know, our loved ones taking a chance to get out there and get T-boned by someone that we couldn't see coming. Um, so to their credit, again, they're, they're looking into that, and we expect to hear something from them um, fairly quickly. Uh, the recommendation we made, that's changing a signal head and some timing. So that, that, that could be fairly simple. Um, so the Beulah Interchange, everyone has been hearing about the Beulah Interchange for, I expect, probably a decade or maybe two even. Um, it has been in the work program. It has moved around in the five-year work program. Sometimes it falls out, sometimes it falls in. Um, 
As you know, construction prices have risen dramatically over the last two years. Case in point, we estimated a 1.5 mile long um, brand new road, um, well, it was the Kingsfield Extension. Um, back in 2021, that priced out at just over $11 million. Well, it's now over 20. So costs have really gone up. So DOT has the same problems that the county has, is if those construction costs goes up and revenue does not go up with it, it's very hard to meet in the middle. So they've had to shove some projects around. Um, so we, they are absolutely still interested in the Beulah Interchange. Um, as a matter of fact, we have them looking at how it's going to connect to not only uh, Kingsfield Road in the existing orientation, but Waste Services is looking at sliding Beulah Road over to be able to expand the landfill. And we're, look, we're asking DOT to look at better how to connect into that instead of doing a little fish hook on Kingsfield and then having to make another turn. So they're, they're, uh, they're studying that again, and we, we definitely appreciate their help there. Um, let's see, let's move on to the Florida Forward. I think everyone uh, heard a couple, of, a couple of months back, uh, Governor DeSantis had an initiative to uh, move Florida forward with infrastructure projects. And many of those projects are in South Florida, as you might expect where the population is, but we were able to get one here. And so our project here is on I-10 from the way station to east of Nine Mile Road. So what they're going to do is they're going to uh, make that stretch of I-10 six lanes and they're going to rework the interchange here at Nine Mile Road. And what that is going to entail is rebuilding the overpasses so that it, if you go from this direction toward the east, you can see that Nine Mile Road is really, really wide and then it kind of narrows up under the overpass. So by reconstructing the overpass, they can spread that out. And they're also gonna put what, what's called a diverging diamond interchange there. I am not going to try to explain to you what a diverging diamond interchange is. I would recommend you go to Google and just Google diverging diamond and you're gonna see all kinds of animations. And basically what you do is you stop on both sides of the interstate and when one lane gets to, or when one direction gets to go, they're actually gonna cross over and go the wrong way to be able to make that quick left to get on the interstate. And what it does is it moves the cycle time of the, of the signals up quicker and it, it has proven to be more efficient. It's been around since the 70s in Europe, and it's, it's coming, coming to the United States. I, I rode my motorcycle through one in Missouri and was scared to death the entire time, but after I went through, I was like, well, that was awesome. That's, it, it really was able to move traffic. So not only will that be happening at uh, Nine Mile Road and I-10, and again, that's $162 million worth of construction in 2026, Right after that, the design will be underway for the very same type of interchange at Pine Forest Road in I-10. Now, they don't have construction dollars set aside for that yet, but there are, there are like three studies in that corridor that begin at 297A and work their way down to the interstate for capacity improvements and intersection improvements, not only at 297A and Nine Mile, um, but additional lanes on Pine Forest. And then there's another section being studied from I-10 south to, I'd say probably just past Interstate Circle in there. And we know that the latest study is gonna show that that section is going to be six lane for sure. And of course, anytime you add lanes, you add cost. And so that tends to, that tends to move things out a little further. But what we've, what we've learned is that in, in very populated areas like that, sometimes right of way cost approach the same cost as construction. So buying land to be able to put the roads in and the retention ponds is in some cases just about as expensive as building the road. Um, so anyway, those, those are two major, major projects coming in um, right there. And that's really all I have for Beulah. If you Longleaf? Uh, Longleaf is, is underway. Um, the, uh, the detour, if it hasn't already gone into effect, is about to so that you would have to go, it's a long way around, but we do have to re rebuild the bridge. Um, there at Weimart, and uh, I know uh, the construction division is, is pretty well handling that project, and they're, they're moving along. Once that's wrapped up, we're going to look at running sidewalks up Weimart to the north to catch those, um, 
those neighborhoods to get them to the schools and to get them to what will eventually be a pedestrian pass, path from Pine Forest Road all the way through to Highway 29. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Appreciate that update. Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. We talked about Florida Forward. Um, let's talk next about the um, master plan. Tim Day is here from our Natural Resources Department. Here he comes. He's up next. Um, when I took office in 2016, there was a big movement in Beulah to do a community master plan, and we um, impaneled a lot of folks. In fact, before we do this, Tim, let me, let me just, I'm going to do something real quick. If you guys would just indulge me, that way I can figure out how many people, first, just raise your hand if you live in Beulah, and then keep it up for me for a minute. Raise your hand if you live in Beulah. Okay, now keep it up. If you've lived here for longer than five years, keep it up. If you've lived here longer than 10 years, keep it up longer than 15 years, keep it up. 16 years, 17, 18, 19, 20. No, <laughs> the prize is we get to know this. No, I appreciate you indulging me because I, I First of all, most of the people here live in Beulah, a, a large, I'd say over 50% have lived here a long time, so that's good. And I asked that question just for my own knowledge and then so we can put some of these issues we're going to discuss into better context going forward. So um, as I was saying, when I took office in 20, uh, 2016, there was a big movement to do a master plan for the entire community. So I impaneled a citizens uh, advisory group, nine member. The board voted to authorize it. And we had a number of meetings for about 14 months right here in, in Beulah Middle School. And a part of what we did with that was we, we utilized University of West Florida's Haas Center to do um, comment cards from the community. We took input from the community, ended up getting more than 5,000 um, responses. And I would just like to know, um, did, did, how many people in the room, when we, we advertised these meetings, we sent out the comment cards, um, we solicited information. And I would just like to know how many people in this room ever either came to one of those meetings or filled out the comment cards? Okay, so a lot of folks didn't participate, but that's okay, because a lot of folks did. Um, and so what we've done, we had a, a Restore Act project which funded the master plan. And we, we recently put it out to bid. Of course, during COVID, we had to suspend a lot of the work on it. Um, but the board just did approve two months ago, and we um, approved the contract with Sigma Group. So we will be doing a Beulah master plan. It's, uh, it's probably about 20 years late. But, it, it, but it's better late than never. And it's not by a lack of trying, I can tell you. Um, but I just wanted folks to know that going in. Now, with that, Tim, tell us when it's going to start and how it's going to proceed. This is Tim Day. Please welcome him. Good evening. Um, I'm Tim Day. I work for Natural Resources Department in the county. Um, I'm kind of co-managing this uh, project with Forrest Jones in uh, Development Services. Um, as you know, master planning has a lot of elements to it, and so uh, we just decided it would, as a joint effort we'd be certain to cover what most people are going to be interested in. Um, the board, you know, about two months ago did award the contract to Sigma. We're very happy to be working with them. Uh, last week we had a staff kickoff with them. Um, they're, they're bringing their team to Beulah over the next couple weeks. They're going to come through the area with staff kind of get the lay of the land, and probably in the next month or so is when we'll start having a lot of outward-facing opportunities to start public input into it. Um, there's going to be a number of ways to be able to provide input, anything from uh, direct comments, whether it's to staff or directly to Sigma. Uh, they will have a series of threats so that you, you can interact with their planners. Um, so it should be a very... Um, you know, well thought out. I'm, I'm very excited to get to an end product that I think will do a very good job of representing Beulah and, and how it's going to move forward. Thank but, you, Tim. Yep. Appreciate it. All right. One other bit of housekeeping. I, I was remiss and I neglected to mention uh, when I thanked the school board and Kevin Adams and the, the folks at Beulah Middle School. Um, our good friend um, allowed us to, to use this, this facility. And um, Frank, uh, is Frank still in here? Where is he? Frank, Frank Murphy, where did he go? Well, Frank Murphy is the, just took over as principal of the school today. I was going to recognize him. He was, uh, 
He was the principal over at Escambia High School for many, many years when I was on the school board. Good guy, hard worker. Uh, we appreciate Frank Murphy and uh, everyone's hospitality here. All right, now we're gonna talk a little bit about something that's very, very uh, important to me, and I know it's the main reason why most of you guys are here. So um, I've put together a little PowerPoint of some factual information, and I'm gonna go through it. It's not a long PowerPoint, but I think it's very important um, to set the table and to put some context into the discussion that has evolved around OLF-8, um, why the county got it, the purpose, uh, why we acquired it, how much we spent for it, how much we still owe on it. When I say we, I mean you. You're the taxpayers. It's your money. And not just the taxpayers in Beulah, taxpayers in Myrtle Grove, North Park, um, Perdido, all around the county, the airport area. So without further ado, we're going to go through it. At the very end, there's a QR code if you'd like to uh, have the PowerPoint, that way you can research it for yourself. Um, there are some hyperlinks, again, that go to source documents that we can discuss. So I'm going to move to this mic. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, that's even better. All right. So the OLFA story that began as an initiative concerning employment, the economy locally, military jobs, protecting the military missions, diversifying our economy, and most importantly, providing high-wage careers for Sandy County citizens. Next slide. Right now, you know, that's 2022, and um, you can, if you choose to download this at the end of the presentation, you can click, click the hyperlinks and read it. Right now, military and DOD-related jobs, are, there's 42,000 of them in our area. They, oh, wait, no, you clicked it. You click, that's okay. We'll go back. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, creating $7.8 billion in local impact, and the key number here is $83,000 in average pay. That's a tremendous boost to our economy. By contrast, tourism, we all know how important tourism is. Many of us growing up work in that industry, restaurants um, and the like. But tourist-related jobs, uh, there's 22,000 locally. This is from Visit Pensacola. They create $2 billion in local impact, so that's no joke. That's for real. But 28,000 is the average pay. So you can see there's a huge delta between what military DOD-related jobs pay and what tourism pays. Now, the data, so let me click that first hyperlink so folks can see. This is from Florida West. And if you, if you scroll that down, if you scroll that down past the cockpit, a little past that, little right there, just leave that right there. This is where this information comes from. This is as of last year. 41,827 uniform civilian jobs, 32,000 veterans living in the Pensacola area, by the way, which is the second highest concentration in the country. We have a high concentration of military retirees, which is very good for our economy, by the way. 7.8 billion in annual economic impact, 340.7 million in annual defense procurement spending, and again, 83,000 uh, is the average wage, which is fantastic. Okay, if you could hit the second uh, hyperlink, please, after we get through the advertising. Okay, this is a link to uh, my favorite publication in the area, Pensacola News Journal. I'm saying that somewhat facetiously, people that know me know why, but if you, cl if you click down, I actually like Jim. Jim's a good guy. He's all right. He's a good article. If you go down, they uh, link some information directly this is called, as I said, and it's in the going. I promise we'll get there. Oh, we got there. All right, well, it's not coming up. But anyway, the figure, you know, about the number of jobs and the uh, impact and the money is in this article. So we'll go ahead and move to the next slide. And then, of course, the folks who will want to read about it can click that. So next slide. So, of course, as we can tell, all sectors, all other sectors of, of, are important. We've got a lot of small businesses. We've got a lot of mom and pop businesses. They're all important, but they're less impactful than those military jobs and those tourism jobs. And as we found out after the oil spill, you know, when you pull the leg out of the stool, you've got a three-legged stool, and you pull tourism out, well, we all remember what happened in 2010. A lot of us lost money in our businesses or real estate. So it's very important to diversify the economy. So go ahead and click the less impactful. This is going to show you the top 50 local employers. Now, remember, defense was 43,000. Okay, so as you can imagine, and we'll just go slowly through these. I mean, you can, again, you can download this and produce it yourself. This is one standing for the West. And you can see the usual suspects, Navy Federal, Baptist Healthcare, Sacred Heart, and there's West Florida. You know, and as you get down, big numbers but small numbers compared to the military missions. Okay. All right, thank you, Davis. And this, this is a great list, by the way. It goes through all the way, all the way down. All right, next slide. All right, so let's talk about the history of OLF-8. 
Why did OLFA, why did the whole thing happen? It's because in the very first line up there was the 1993 BRAC, a very important mission that NAS High School of Florida put a lot of men to work. Our friend Kevin Adams worked at one of the depots over there. He remembers when this happened. Well, the 1993 BRAC, they closed NADA, which was a, a devastating hit to the economy here locally. Uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of jobs, lots of buildings got torn down. It was devastating. In 1995, the NADA closed. Okay. Around that time, after people realized the devastating impact of losing jobs, the Pensacola Chamber of Commerce and Escambia were contacted by the NADA in 1997. That's when it started. And they said, we need to find a way to, to protect these missions and provide good jobs. And we can work together to do it. They said, we need to do something up there in Beulah near the interstate. Now, they couldn't work it out. The oil up eight field at that time was a operational field for whiting, for training, um, but they had the first discussion, and actually they identified a piece of property in northern Sandy County, the Navy, and the Chamber of Commerce, a lot of business leaders went up, it was unworkable, the terrain, the geography was bad, and the whole thing fell apart. Okay, next slide. All right, then came 2005, BRAC again, and we lost our officer candidate school, Pet school. How many people remember when you got officer, officer candidate school, remember that? Those were good-paying jobs. Those were high-paying military members, and they went back to Newport, Rhode Island, and we lost them. 2008, final OCS class, graduated from NAS Pensacola. All right, before that, slightly before that, we went back, 1997, the day you said, we gotta do something out with you, we gotta do something to create jobs, we gotta do something in the last large open areas that are near the freeway, and that's where Project Tucker happened. And that was, Project Tucker, go ahead and click that link, that's an interesting link. That's how we got the Navy Federal Credit Union in Pensacola. That's how it happened. And if you read this article, there's a lot of great information. Of course, I'm not going to go through it right now. But it tells the story of how the county, the Chamber of Commerce, the Navy, the Military Affairs Committee, and Navy Federal Credit Union work, along with the county, to set up the first commerce park out here to just see, could we get $16 an hour jobs? And it did. And we know what happened after that. That, that commerce park that the county established with the Navy sold out. Grew and grew and grew, and it's been one of the greatest things that's really frankly ever happened in Pensacola in terms of job diversification. It's, it's a very good employer. Okay, back. And I would encourage everyone to read uh, these background documents because it's again it's important to tell the story in context and tell it the way it is. 2007, right before the last OCS class graduated, the Navy re-engaged with Pensacola Chamber and the BCC on the, on the property exchange. But then the Great Recession happened. Next slide. And that fell apart. And by the way, this is being a good time to interject. I don't care what developer you are, I don't care what county you are, you cannot go to the Navy and say, we like your property, we'd like to buy it, we want to, it doesn't work that way. It was a very complex transaction. A lot of different people were involved for many, many, many years because you can't just write a check to the Navy, they're not going to do it. They have to have something that, that improves their mission, that benefits them, and benefits the economy locally. And so there are only a few methods you can do it, and property swap is one of them. We had the Great Recession, no deal between the United States Navy and the Board of County Commissioners, although there were talks throughout that period. And I, I'll give a little more context here. In 2006, I joined the Escambia County School Board as a school board member for this district. I had three kids in school. As a part of that, I served on the Military Affairs Committee for the Chamber of Commerce from 2006 to 2015. So I had those conversations with those military men, those members of the chambers, and OLF-8 came up very frequently, way before I was on the Board of County Commissioners. Okay, but there was no deal because we had the recession. All right, next slide. Everyone remembers what happened in 2010. Another hit to tourism, a devastating economic environmental impact. Tourism was hurt, um, but the only silver lining came a couple years later when we had a major victory for the Panhandle with the Triumph Gold Coast uh, grant of 2012, which kept $1.5 billion from oil spill money from BP in the eight most affected counties in the Panhandle, which was really a, an amazing feat because believe me, the rest of the state, they wanted to put their vetoes into that money, believe me, they did. But here in Pensacola, Escambia County, Walton County, Oakland, so we're the ones who bore the brunt of that. Next slide. So we had the Restore Act, major project uh, for the environment, restoration, and economic recovery. There were so many businesses that went under. We had the double win, 2007, 2009. And then this, businesses went under, restaurants went under, the beach got crushed, it was a terrible time. From 2012 to 2016, we had a Restore Act committee that was in Hamilton in 2012. Go ahead and click that second uh, hyperlink there. I want to show the full 
to you. And, and again, you can go to the county's website, you can do your own research on these things that I've covered. This was the uh, Restore Act Advisory Committee. These were the ladies and gentlemen who served on it, uh, folks in the community, um, subject matter experts, people who know a lot about the economy. You'll recognize some names up there, people that own businesses. Well, they racked and stacked, okay, go back to this. They racked and stacked over 100 projects. projects and they put them in buckets because of course the mission of the Restore Act was to restore the economy, the environment, and the infrastructure. And so I want to make sure, go down just a little bit, scroll, no the other way, I'm sorry, just the other way, the other way, up a little bit. Okay, now look at that date, that's, that's an important thing, Restore Projects 2015. These were the projects that the committee was uh, considering. 2015 I was on the school board, I was not on the county commission. Look to your left and I want you to pay attention on the upper left corner, if you can read it, I know it's an eye test, but the number one project that that committee recommended, knowing about BRAC, knowing about the military spending, knowing about, knowing about the jobs, was OLFA and the Commerce Department. 2015, before I was elected. Very important. Okay, back. Okay, next slide. There it is again. Next slide. Okay, so the next year, 2013. Was the first Board of County Commissioner investment in Ola X in Santa Rosa County. Because again, there's only a few ways you can get that big property in Yuma. One of those ways is you buy property in Santa Rosa County, you fix it the way the Navy wants to, and then you swap it. So in 2013, we started now. There are some people who say that was the start. But let me just tell you, that's not true. There have been discussions for years, starting in 1997. Because this is a complex process. Someone can't just walk up to the podium and Board of County Commissioners and say, okay, give us some money for this property over at Santa Rosa and, and maybe we can do something. It doesn't work that way. These folks have been talking for years and years and years and finally bubbled to the surface again in 2013. 2016, additional funding for OLF 8 was needed because the Navy had requirements. The requirements for the field in Santa Rosa County had gone up exponentially. There was anti-terrorism force protection uh, considerations. There was different fencing that was needed, lighting. It got really expensive. Um, I came into office as county commissioner at the tail end of that during the firestorm of, of the spending. And I will tell you, my first year in office, 2016 17, a lot of people, there were a lot of folks, and, I, and by the way, full disclosure, I lived in Hilo for 19 years, right across from Hilo, right, right across from Hilo. I love it here. I love it out here. But there were a lot of folks who were very concerned about the money we were spending, giving money to the federal government to try and get this property. They said, you're, you're spending a fortune. At that point, I want to say we were up to eight or nine million. And they said, just be responsible. Fiscally irresponsible, you lose money, you lose taxpayers' money. Well, we kept at it. We stayed the course. A few years later, we had to put a couple more million in. 2017, um, we submitted an application to try and Gulf Coast because they had 1.5 billion for economic. It was a $29 million project, infrastructure, stormwater, drainage, roads all the way through it for the Commerce Park that the Restore Act picked as the number one project. Next slide. So, where are we? What, what, what did we end up doing? We ended up spending 18 and a half million. We, you, you, through the Board of County Commissioner, we spent 18 and a half million in local option sales tax money to acquire the field. Land slop, land slop, slop, swap was completed in 2019, and OLF 8 became a Escambia County property. Shortly thereafter, we sold 100 acres to Navy Federal Credit Union for 4.2 million. And that was for parking, stormwater, and for community amenities. And if you drive, I mean, you all have seen it. It looks fantastic. I can't wait till it, it opens. And by the way, part of the deal when we made that property sale with Navy Federal was that those amenities would be usable by the public. So I can't wait till it's open. Basketball courts, walking trails, it's very nice. So that brought down the total that we owed significantly. So we got a Restore Act for the master plan. That was different pot of money. We had 1.5 million in that master plan. I inherited that from my predecessor, Wilson Robertson. In fact, when I took office, he said, he said, Jeff, are you going to continue that project? He said, absolutely. The Restore Act committee picked it, number one. We got the money from the oil spill. We know the value of military jobs. Of course I'm going to stick with it. And I did. But here is when something really cool happened. Something very good happened. Navy Federal stepped up and they said, listen, we'll pay the master plan. We'll pay. And so that 1.5 million, we were able to take that 
spend it at the airport to bring SC engineering here. And they're in the process of building 1,700 jobs, direct jobs, which will turn into about 3,500 direct and indirect jobs at the airport, high paying and good paying jobs. So it was a win-win. And we all know David Federal uh, paid a master plan firm to come down here, and they, they, they put together a great master plan. Now, there were some bumps in the road. You know, nothing's perfect. But overall, uh, they did a good job. Next slide. So, 2020 through 2022, we know what happened, COVID-19. But in the middle of that, as I said, DPZ came down, worked on the master plan, a lot of you folks. How many people participated in the DPZ master plan in this room? Not that many, okay. Um, and we ended up with a compromise, right? That's what happened. I could go through the entire uh, litany of issues, um, but we ended up with a compromise because some folks wanted certain things. A lot of folks didn't want jobs. Um, the purpose of the, of the acquisition was for jobs. One thing I never wanted, and I think a lot of people agree with me, I think, even people that don't necessarily agree with me on a lot of things, but I didn't want any housing on that field. I think when we talk about infrastructure and the stress on our infrastructure, I didn't, want to, I didn't want to compete with the private market for housing. I mean, I wanted to use it for other things. I wanted restaurants, I wanted amenities, I wanted good jobs, and I wanted some open space. That's what I wanted. That's what, that's what I wanted. But again, hey, it's not a monarchy, it's a democracy, so I lost. So we ended up, well, we ended up with, a, with a compromise. Even people, look, no one was happy. You know what that means? That means you're probably good, right? No one was happy. I wasn't happy. Not enough jobs. Too much housing. So that's where we're at. So what do we do? We aggressively marketed it. We got the compromise hybrid plan. Davis, click that hyperlink so we can show the folks uh, the plan that we ended up with. Again, uh, this one's Emma Kennedy. Just go down so we can just show that. You guys, again, if you, if you download this, no, I mean, uh, I've, I've saved down on it. Uh, Davis, I'm sorry. Uh, the other up. The other up, yeah. A little further up. There's a little, there's, can you see it? There's a picture on the top. There we go, okay, all right. There we go, it kind of shows, you know, there's some commerce, there's some housing, you know, some green space. Um, these, there were four different ones, and we ended up settling on what we call the hybrid. So where are we at right now? Where are we at? The county, we're in the hole, 14.3 million. The county, we, you, in the hole, 14.3 But not just us, not just you, the entire county. Remember, Myrtle Grove, Purdue, Purdue Keith? Because we, we told them we're buying this property to make jobs for the whole county, right? So that's where we're at. So we've got a compromise plan, and we've got a couple people interested in buying it. All right, next slide. 2022, 23, we've aggressively marketed it. Um, we marketed the property. We had two offers in 2023, Breland and D.R. Horton with Sterling Properties. Remember, I didn't want any housing, but this thing's been on the market for a year and a half. They were the only ones who came and put a check in our hands. Now, let me just explain one thing so that, because some people in the room may not know this. When we passed that master plan, that hybrid plan, and we compromised, we took the elements of that master plan and we put it in our code. So, a lot of people are upset. Don't let them do this. I'm, as your representative, I'm sticking with the master plan. Look, I had to hold my nose when I voted for it. I didn't like it. I didn't want any housing. I didn't want apartments. I didn't want hotels. I wanted jobs. But when you make a deal, you stick with it. So I'm sticking with the master plan. It's in our code of ordinances. I just want people to know that because there's some propaganda that somehow we're going to violate the master plan. Now, Right now, what we've seen from these offers doesn't 100% comport with it. Guess what? No matter what we do, it'll never be 100%. I want everyone to know in this room, I invited DPZ. I spoke with Maria Khoury. I said, please come to the meeting. Please speak to people. Unfortunately, she was unable to come. I also invited DPZ. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Horton. I invited Horton, and I invited Sterling. Up until yesterday, I thought they were coming. Their lawyers told them because of the contract negotiations, they couldn't make it. As of right now, I'm aware of one other big firm. Good news, it's local. It's very, very interesting as well. But right now, we don't have a deal. We don't have a deal. What we have is ordinances that honor the master plan commitment that the board voted. We've got two people that are interested in a partnership, and we owe 14 and a half grand, or 14 and a half million, 14.3. 
All right? So April 6th, everyone in the world knew that was the, the day. The board talked about it. Everyone was told about it. Freeland did not come. They sent, they sent drawings. They sent ideas two days before the meeting. The president of that company called me, and I said, are you coming to the meeting? I like their plan better. Their plan. I like their written offer. I didn't like their, their, what the plan, I liked their contract, I didn't like their drawing. The drawing looked like about 85% housing. It was a non-starter for me. They didn't even come to me. And since that time, they haven't contacted me. So a lot of people are mad at me and say, we want to agree with them. Look, I can take a horse to the water tank. I can't make them drink. I can't demand someone come put a check in my hand and buy something if they don't want to. They knew about the meeting, they didn't come. They could have called since, they haven't. They could have submitted another contract with more money. They didn't. So for people that talk about Breland, Breland didn't want it. That's what happened. Right now we have DR Horton and Sterling. And here's the final thing I'll say before we get on to the next part of the town hall. And I can hear from you guys. Again, as I, as I reiterated, I support the master plan. It will not be 100% like that. Some, some components of what was written in that master plan, I'm told by multiple different people in the trades, make it very, very difficult economically. Now we've got two issues. We've got two issues. We've got a lack of affordable housing. Everyone knows that. That's why rents for dumpy two-bedroom apartments on Davis, right? You can just imagine what they look like are 15, 1600 bucks. Kids are going to college and their rents out of control. They've got six, six or seven college kids in these dumpy little two. That's a product, that's a product of supply and demand. The economists will tell you we haven't built enough to keep up. So that and the, the high the high cost of rent and the and the increases in housing is because of supply and demand. Um, even with that said, I think, I don't think OLF8 was the place to put them. I'm just gonna say that. I'll say it to my dying day, but again, we made a compromise. So that's kind of where we're at. Next slide. No, oh, that's a duplicate. Next slide. All right, so right now, as I said, the deal's still being negotiated. We desire to stick to the spirit of the master plan, and that's been said publicly over and over. Uh, tonight's, tonight's town hall is for your input, your information. And I just want to say, every step of the way on this project, since I've been in this office, we, we, I say we, have been accused by some of doing something wrong. Again, we had six, seven, eight million in the thing before I took office. Oh, those commissioners, you know, they're so irresponsible, you're gonna lose money, you're never gonna do it. I got in office, we put a lot more in. We got up to 18 million. Oh, those commissioners are gonna, oh, what a terrible thing. People. People thought we wouldn't be able to turn this around. They didn't think we'd be able to turn it into something. We've already turned it into something, and we're about to turn it into something good. The estimates I'm hearing from staff and others who are associated with real estate, if we sell it for anywhere near what's on the table right now, we will actually, this is something government normally never does. Government normally buys things real expensive and then sells them for <coughs> cheap, right? This, we're gonna change that paradigm. We bought this thing reasonable, and we're gonna sell it for a lot of money. But here's the best part. When we sell it for money, we're going to divide that, those proceeds, and we're going to put that money, I know for District 1, I intend to, and I know that for my counterparts, we have a lot of projects on the books, we don't have funding. This could be $27 million in funding for infrastructure, stormwater, sidewalks, drainage, you name it. That's why I want to sell it. That, and I just don't know about this economy. I know they made a deal, I know the stocks went way up, but at some point, I just think that thing's going to collapse, and I'm worried about it. I don't want to be holding this property. No one knows what interest rates are going to do. Um, a lot of people are concerned. So with that, we're going to move on to the next, oh, next slide. I want to show them this. Oh, wait, yeah, this is cool. I'm going to give this information. And then I promise this slide will be over. So why do we do economic development? Why do we go after companies like Navy Federal, Circular Gene, and Pegasus Labs, and ST Aerospace? Why do we do those things? We do that to create good jobs because of what happened at BRAC. When you're too reliant on one segment, tourism, military, you're very vulnerable. Any kind of a, a drawdown, a, a loss of emission, a oil spill on the beach, and you're, and you're hurt very, very badly. So we've concentrated on, dip, on diversifying our job space. And so what does that produce? I learned this at a, uh, at a luncheon the other, the other day uh, at the Yacht Club from Dr. Rick Harper, who ran the Haas Center at UWF. Very, very smart guy, very bright guy. He studies it, I mean, he's just intelligent. Click that first hyper. This is amazing stuff. This is awesome. Oh wait, actually, no, not this one. Well, actually, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, this is that's Dr. Harper. This is my blog post on the topic. All right. 
356, 356 large counties locally. And they study them and they look at year over year job growth, 2021 to 2022, out of 356 large counties throughout this country. Escambia County was number 22, number 22. So that means we're doing something right. We're bringing good jobs here. That's important. Now, why is that important? Because when students graduate, you want them to have the ability to walk into a good job. You don't want them to graduate and have to go to Atlanta or Tampa or Dallas or California or New York. I mean, that's why I left. When I graduated in the mid 80s, there was no opportunity here. A lot of kids did. You probably know kids that did. I wanted to stay, I couldn't. When my kids graduate, I want them to be able to stay here. And that's what it's all about. And those figures are what it's all about. Um, go back to the point. And again, all this stuff is there. I, I encourage you to, to click it if you're interested in this topic. Um, the Scammy County of Pensacola, we're outpacing Mobile, Alabama. I don't know how many of y'all go to Mobile. I go there sometimes. I was there for New Year's. Great concert, mass shooting. It was amazing. Um, there really was a shooting, too. That wasn't amazing. Um, it's a big city, right? Big skyscrapers, all this stuff. But look, but let's take a look at something. There's been a lot of men and women working in Escambia County to bring good jobs and good opportunities, right? So let's look at this. Escambia County, Pensacola, we're outpacing Mobile, Alabama in terms of our job growth in our area. We, we created 44,200 non-farm jobs to Mobile's 10,500 from 1990 to 23. Now click that hyperlink. To me, that's an amazing uh, testament. I'm not trying to throw myself, but again, go go down. I'll show you this. Oh, I didn't have another picture, but anyway, I encourage you to click it. All the links are there. The PowerPoints from both those gentlemen, um, that, those are factual statistics, and they really speak volumes. Now, I know everyone in the room. Uh, how many here own a home? Okay, just about everyone. How many, leave your hands up for a second. How many own a home? How many have owned your home for five years, 10 years? 15 years, 16, 17, 18, 19. All right, so a lot of you have owned them for a long time. I can tell you this, one of the other slides, I didn't put it up, one of the other slides was just the amount of equity and the amount of uh, growth in um, wealth from real, real estate in Scammy County, and that's because of all the things that we're doing. When you bring high wage jobs, and you have a constricted supply. So everyone in this room that had their hand up for a good deal of time, if you've been responsible, you probably have a lot of equity in your home. I know I do, and it's been fantastic. That's another thing that's good. So I want to go to the final slide now. Uh, actually, the second to last one. I want everyone to uh, take a picture of this if you want. If you don't know how to get a hold of me, here's how you do it. There's my cell phone. There's my office phone. There's my email. I do a monthly coffee. I do these from time to time. I'm doing one next month in Perdido, in District 1. And uh, next slide. And then for those of you who use technology, this will be good. So someone tell me if this works. Let's see if I copy the right QR code. But this allows you to download the entire PowerPoint. Okay, I've got the thumbs up. And so when you do that, you'll have all those hyperlinks. And you can go do your own research. So, you know, again, when people want to say OLF is just, eh, the last nine or ten years, it's a lie. It's not true. It's been, it's been in the works for many, many years. A lot of people have worked very hard to make it come to pass. Now, next, we're going to talk about some questions uh, on comment cards. We have some comment cards from you. If you did not have a comment card, or if you have one, this is my aide, Debbie Kenny. If you have a card, hand it to her, and we're going to go through them one by one, and we're going to have the subject matter experts from staff answer any questions uh, that, are, that are submitted. And we're, it looks like we don't have that many, so that's good. Okay. And again, if you have questions, put them on a card, pass them to Debbie, and we'll start with Teresa Blackwell. If me, if we were not allowed a public comment time where we could speak on OLF8 and others like Perdido Key got to speak, why is that? I, I don't know. I don't know what Perdido Key did. I know that that's in my district now. And let me tell you, they have a master plan there. They have a habitat conservation plan there, and and those things. Ex yeah. Uh, I'm not saying you can't. Did you see the last item on my agenda? Yeah, I've I've public I've public yeah of course question and answer. I'm going to stay here and talk to everyone, everyone. I'm going to stay here and talk to everyone. But what I have found in my experience is, if I get these, I can read them, 
and I can get a lot of things out. And a lot of people might have the same questions, right? So it's more efficient. And I value people's times. Everyone's got stuff. People got ball practice. They got the kids. Everything. I know it. I live it. But no, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to listen to anyone. That's what we're going to be, and that's what we're going to do. All right. Teresa Blackwell again. Okay. How many acres did Wes Marino say he was holding back? Just put it on the bottom. Was holding back from selling an OLFA in light industrial. Could not understand what he said, at least at the last copy in the commissioner. Okay. When will the BCC get the draft counter offer from Dior Horton? Yeah, the um, Dior Horton gave us an offer. We countered the offer. Dior Horton still has it. That's why Joe Everson from Dior Horton's not here tonight. His lawyers said they couldn't. They're in the middle of a contract negotiation, you know. Um, and I, I can respect that because he could compromise his position uh, if he was here and got dragged into something. But he did. He did tell me when I spoke with him. He said, if we're able to reach a deal, he'll come to the next town hall that I have in Beulah, and he'll come speak and answer questions. So uh, the number of acres, 250. 250 acres. That's how much we're holding. Did you say 250? 250. 250. Can people hear me? I thought this mic was working. Two, 250. Is that better? 250 acres. That's what we're holding back. All right. Next question. This is from Rose Black. What is D.R. Horton's plan? For the wetlands, will there be a stoplight at Bridalwood and Nine Mile someday? Um, Bridalwood and Nine Mile, I'm not sure the answer to that question. Chris? I don't think so. Yeah, the thing is, to do something like that on Mobile Highway would require FDOT to warrant it. I don't know, I don't necessarily know that there's enough uh, traffic. We can, we can ask for that, and we could ask for us, we could ask for them to study it, but uh, these, these calculations are based upon the traffic. Um, Dear Horton's plan for the wetlands, no matter who has that property, we're not going to allow them to build on the wetlands. I just want to make sure that that's crystal clear to everyone. You cannot build on the wetlands. Now, there may be a way to do some low impact, maybe some trails through there, like they do out at West Florida, which I think would be kind of cool. It'd be kind of nifty. But no, no, you're not going to you're not going to clear the wetlands and build on them. So if that was what you were afraid of, that that's not going to happen. Okay, LeGerald White, is there plans to widen Beulah Road or put it a sidewalk from Mobile to Nine Mile? Yeah. The problem that we have there is there is no right of way. There is no right of way, but the state is working on a plan. In fact, they're designing it. So, Chris, what are they going to do with the site? It's, by the way, that's a state road, right? From Mobile Highway all the way up on Beulah Road, that is a state road. So, I'm going to bring Chris up so he can talk to that. The current plan is just to resurface what's there and make, make some safety improvements. Um, we have seen from Nine Mile Road north, eventually that will be a, a four-lane road once the interchange gets built and everything kind of folds itself together. Okay. All right, okay. right we'll go to this one next. Aaron Choupier. Who do we contact about street issues um, such as intersection with two roads converging where they're um, are not either a yield sign, a stop sign, or a stop. You contact my office. Contact my office. I'll talk to Chris Phillips. That's the man right there. He does all the traffic on all the streets. So if you, again, Davis, can you move it back to the other? So folks, there we go. There's, there's my office number, my cell phone, and my email. Just contact me, give me the specifics, take a picture, whatever you want to do, and I'll give it to Chris. And if it's something simple like that, we can take care of these things relatively quickly. We've been able to do that. We're doing another project in a different part of the county uh, in my district where it was fully funded, million dollars. The community loved it. They embraced it. We want it. We want it. We want a traffic circle. They loved it. They wanted it. I inherited it. It was funded, so we built it. Now, they don't want it. They hate it. So we put, what, a couple hundred grand in extras, rumble strips, extra signs, turtle lights, everything. The fact of the matter is they still don't like it. So. Um, sometimes on these projects, you think you're hitting the sweet spot, but you're not. Because people want one thing, and then when you actually deliver it, a lot of them don't want it. So that's kind of what I'm dealing with. But um, that's not a, a situation for up here. All right, Phil Fiorelli. When are roads going to be widened to accommodate the increased traffic? Lots of new sub subdivisions are and have been built with no new road capacity. It's a great question. It's a great question, and we've, we've done a lot of projects, but Longleaf is a great example. It's just, they take a long time. Um, uh, Klondike, Eight Mile Creek, need attention. There's crowning. Um, yes? Developers get 
get to build, yes. but they don't contribute to fixing the problem they're creating. C correct. And I will tell you, I will tell you, and I get another fact that you can fact check if you'd like to, um, I've brought impact fees to the board. I brought transportation mobility fees to the board. I brought them because I think they're good ideas. I don't have support for them. There is not three votes on the board for them. I brought them two or three times, and I run into a brick wall. Now, here's the thing. I'm not a guy who wants to penalize anyone. People are in business to make a profit, but every other part of the country, every other part of the country has some level of, a, of an impact fee. If you're gonna come in and build a Home Depot uh, on, a, on an intersection, they make you widen the road or add a light. They make you do something right. Um, but unfortunately, I've been, I haven't gotten traction on that. There's not support. Santa Rosa County has been trying to do it. They've fought, fought it out in court. It's a problem. Let me explain how that happened. I, I really supported concurrency, which is really, I think, a better way to do it. Um, we had concurrency when I was on the school board. And so concurrency at the state level just said, if you're a developer and you're going to build 500 uh, house subdivision next to the, the most popular overcrowded school, then you, you're going to either pay the school district to build extra capacity, or you're not going to be able to build there. And in 2011, uh, during the recession as we were coming out of it, the state decided to pull that out. They pulled it out of the state land development code. These are all facts you can check. Horace is shaking his head. But the county, at that time, 2011, put it back into our land development code. So we had concurrence. 2013, the Board of County Commissioners voted to take it out. I was on the school board, I didn't like it. I supported concurrency, I still do. If it's done properly, um, we're not trying to club people over the head, but just make them think about stuff. Again, if you're gonna build 500 uh, house subdivision, you gotta think about the roads, right? You gotta think about the schools, you gotta think about public services like libraries. I'm still gonna work it. We got a new member of the board. I'm not gonna say we're gonna close the door on it. Maybe I'll bring it up the fourth time, like Super Dave Osborne, I'll just keep blowing myself up until, how many people know who Super Dave Osborne was? For those that don't look it up, and then maybe you'll get a chuckle. Um, I'm never going to give up on it because it's a good idea. It's solid. It's what everyone else does, right? All the other parts of the country do that. Okay, here is a comment. I guess. Does that answer your question, Phil? And again, go back, do the research. Every, every meeting of the Board of County Commissioners is on videotape. That's the beautiful thing about it. I can say something to you, and you can go look, and then you can find it. And I'm not going to tell you something that's not true. It's an absolute fact, because I'm on tape right now saying it. Okay, just put them underneath. Okay, this one's from Christina Fortson. It doesn't look like a question, it's a comment. Comment. Keep the DPZ plan that was voted on. We are. Everything that we voted on, just look at what's being built right now. That was part of it. I mean, it was excluded technically because it was the federal's part, but they knew about it, so nothing else has been built there. I think everyone heard me say I supported the compromise. Right, okay. So we're good on that. And approved with the input of over 800 Beaver residents. If Horton gets the bid, they need to be held feet to the fire and adhere strictly to the approved plan. Close, close watch while they work, as we all know, as most of us do, Horton cuts the corners. I've watched them build. Their motto should be, it's easier to pay, to pay fines than ask permission. Look, the last thing I want to do is be up here defending any company like DR Horton. I'm not here for that. Remember what I showed you earlier, how much do we owe on that? I'm looking to get the best deal I can. And of course, like I told you before, we have the elements of the master plan in our, in our code, in our ordinances. So again, this, is, this reminds me a lot of people, when, you know, when we were seven million into it saying, you're, you're just reckless, you're gonna lose money. No, we didn't. And now, you're not gonna follow the master plan. Yes, we are. Look, again, I don't, know if, I don't know if I said this, but I've lived here almost two decades, raised my family here, right across the street. The one thing I really want, if you, if you, if you care, I'd like to have a full service restaurant in Beulah. I'd hate, right, wouldn't that be something? I, I got roller hot dogs at Circle K, burritos spin in the microwave. I don't want that. I want a full service. Phil, can you get a full service restaurant, please? That's what, I'm, that's what I want. And I, you know, and the other thing people say is, how come they're building another car wash? They might, all I can say is they must make a lot of money on the car wash. I don't, I don't know. I don't know about you guys. I don't do it. I wait till a couple days. It's going to rain here. Boom. There's the car wash. But uh, yeah, well, talk to Horace. Horace, how can they, how can they build so many car washes in Beulah? 
<laughs> okay. I want a Trader Joe's. I don't. I want a Costco. Look, I hadn't been to Panama City. I hadn't been to Panama City in 10 years. Went there for a conference about three weeks ago. If you've never driven Back Beach Road, if you've never been there, compared to what it was to compared to what it is, it's incredible. It's amazing. They get a Dave and Buster's. We can't get a Dave and Buster's in Pensacola, Florida. Are you kidding? They get one. Michelle, how does that happen? They get a Dave and Buster's. They have a Top Golf. We can't get that here. They've got. I mean, it's your fault, Michelle. It's my fault. I'll no. take it. Anyway, I, somewhat facetiously, I want those things too. But here's the thing. The, develop, the developers, they go by the codes and the ordinances. So they buy a piece of property. If it's zoned for commercial, they can do a lot of different things. They can build a restaurant or they can build a car wash. For whatever reason, they make a lot of money on car washes. So we can't, when, we, when people buy a piece of property, they have property rights, I can't tell them, hey, um, you, know, you can't build a car wash. You have to build a Dave & Buster's. They, it just doesn't work that way. So that's the reason. Um, I'm going to move very quickly because I have a, one more our audience participation thing that I want to do before we get to uh, just speaking to you face to face. Um, just follow the master plan. Okay, that's easy, easy enough. I think everyone heard me. I'm on tape saying it. Okay, uh, Aaron Shanier. Our housing situation is at the point where local residents of Pensacola are having a hard time even being able to afford a home. The larger cities became the more cr uh, became the more crime along with immorality as it creeps in. In light of all these factors, do you think it is wise to continue building up all of Escambia County? Well, e exactly. Here's, here's the thing. Like I said before, right now on one side, I've got people that are very angry because they can't afford the housing, right? They can't afford it. The kids are going to college at UWF. You have to have eight kids in a two-bedroom apartment because they're 17, 1800 bucks for dumpy apartments. How do I know they're dumpy? My son had to live in one. And I went there to visit, and it was, it was appalling what they were paying for that. It was ridiculous. And then they had to fight Davis traffic. I, I can't even get started. So you, on that, on one hand, you've got people that want to know why the housing is so expensive, why is apartment rent so high. It's a supply and demand thing. Ask any economist. Ask Rick, Rick Harper. Do your own research. It's because we haven't kept up with the demand. We haven't kept up with the demand. So if we don't build, if developers don't build, rents go higher. It's just the way it works. So we have to balance it. That's why we're doing a master plan for this whole area. Again, 20 years late. I've been working on it ever since I came to office, and I'm not going to stop until I leave office. All right. Susan Ellison wants to know, she has a comment. Please listen to the people. We want the master plan that was developed with our input, not, ha not heavy housing and commercial development. Well, I didn't want heavy housing either. I voted against it. It's very clear. Um, we're going to have the housing that we negotiated and not one, not one additional one. Give us a mixture, retail parks, et cetera. That's what I want. I live across the street. That's what I want. Retail parks, et cetera. Our traffic and other infrastructure can't handle the houses. Yeah, exactly. No one wanted houses on that field. I don't know how that happened, uh, but I did get voted. I did get outvoted on that. All right. This one here is a question. Dear Horton, how many single family and how many multifamily units? I have no idea. I have no, they, they're, it's zoned for a certain amount of, of each. Um, you're talking about the field, and that's probably what they're going to do. Jay Ingwell is here. Where is Jay? Hey, Jay. Jay is a member of the planning board. Jay, in fact, I want to take a moment to recognize Jay Ingwell. He's served on the planning board for the last six years, a thankless job. Jay, thank you very much for what you do. Believe me, no one wants to do it. They Unpaid, uh, uncompensated, he sits there, he has to listen to people uh, yelling and screaming, angry, six-hour meetings. Thanks for doing it, Jay. I appreciate it. Okay, Jeff, any chance of implementing impact fees? Well, you heard what I said about it. And it's a fact, look it up. I brought it concurrency, I brought it mobility. There just wasn't, there was no appetite for it, unfortunately. Okay, Stan McDaniels, I have a comment and it's blank. Don't know what that's all about. Yeah, I like your speech. No, no, hang, hang on, we're doing the cards right now. All right, here I have a question. What will come, what will be done to ensure the developer will follow the design plan? Um, well, again, as I said, we have it in our codes, our ordinances. So he has to, right? Isn't that the way that works for us? If he wants to get something approved, he's got to follow our ordinance, which, is, which was taken directly from the master plan. Again, people want to hurl stones and say, you're not following the plan. We haven't built anything. The dirt hasn't turned yet. We are going to follow the plan. It's just the plan may not be 100% as you think it is. And by the way, I spoke to Marina Corey, and what, what did she say? She said, Jeff, sometimes these things have to evolve. That's what she told me. She's the one who wrote the plan. 
I wish she was here. She could explain it. Maybe people would know. Um, okay, here's Robert Bruce. Please show the original plat plan versus the one now on the table. Big difference. Well, you can, yeah, you can certainly find that. It's out there. Again, no one got everything they wanted. It was supposed to be a giant commerce park with a little retail on the front. That's what we uh, bought it for. And then uh, other people didn't want any jobs there. They wanted uh, houses and a mall. And somewhere in the middle of the mix and all of it is where we got. Um, so you can go online and easily find that. If you click that one link that I put up there, you'll see all four uh, original ones that we came up with from DPZ. Okay, Tom Kelly. Any plans to expand Mobile Highway to four lanes from the fairgrounds uh, through Beulah? No. Nope, that's a state road. They're not. They're repaving it. They're making some improvements, but they're not going to four-lane it. And they're not four-laning it because it doesn't justify it. The traffic, traffic counts don't justify it, which is hard to believe, but uh, I, guess, I guess that's what they're saying. Okay, Sarah Randolph. Please provide the details of the, the communications with Breland. How much follow-up did the county do to get them to stay engaged? Were they asked whether a different date to meet would work for them? I don't know. I talked to the president of the company the day before the meeting. The day prior to that, he had sent his plan to the county. When he called me, I told him, I said, you need to come tomorrow. He says, well, um, you know, I, I can't make it. I can't make it. I said, well, send a representative. That happens a lot, right? I can't be somewhere. I send Debbie. Um, Michelle can't be somewhere. She sends her aide. I mean, that, you just send someone. But no one came. No one came. And they didn't call. And they didn't send anything. So again, this fixation on Breland, look, they go, let me use a term that kids like to use. They ghosted us. How about that? That's what happened. So you just got to get past it. That's what happened. All right. Teresa Blackwell, again, we need more inspections of construction. I don't disagree with you. We need more inspections of construction. Can uh, we have the staff up for that? Dior Horton will take a lot of uh, overs. I can't read your handwriting. I, I think I get the flavor of it. In other words, we need more staff to make sure that they follow the plan. Yeah, I, 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 I don't disagree with that at all. Look, I want to say one thing about Dior Horton. Again, I'm not, this isn't an infomercial for Dior Horton. They came with a big check, right? But here's the thing about D.R. Horton. Some places in this country, number one, they're the biggest home builder in the country. They're listed on the stock exchange. They're massive, they're huge. So they're gonna have a big target. Anything goes wrong, it gets magnified. It's like if you have a bad meal at the Chinese restaurant, you're gonna tell everyone. You have a great meal at the restaurant, you don't tell anyone, right? So bad news gets magnified. I'm not here to defend them, but I will say this. Other parts of the country where they're held to high standards, they build quality products. That's why they're the number one home builder in the country. It didn't happen by accident. So my, my intention, whoever we do this deal with, is going to have to follow the, the codes and the ordinances that, that we've put in, in, in force. So that's what's going to happen, Teresa. All right. Jim Harmon. Do we have any idea of what businesses will be coming to the area? Well, we've had a lot. We've had a lot come. We know about Navy Federal. There's several more. The thing about economic development, and I serve on the PEDC, the thing about economic development is you have to be very careful with the information. A couple of years back, we had a company from Pennsylvania very interested in coming to one of our commerce parks and building. They made a unique product, um, and they had a good, a good corner on the market. And they were going to bring about 20 good manufacturing jobs down here. They were going to spend about 800000 to build a property. And, um, you know, a, a member of the Board of County Commissioners, one of the guys I served with, got wind of it. Didn't like it. Didn't support economic development. Personally, he didn't. The rest of the four of us did, because we know these numbers. We know what happens when you prime the pump. Well, he leaked it. So this poor company in Pennsylvania had all these plans. But when these companies make these moves, they have to do it very strategically. I mean, otherwise their employees freak out. Oh my god, do I have to move to Florida? What am I going to do? And so it leaked, and it got into the press, and the deal got killed. So. Can I tell you every deal that's in the works right now? No, and I wouldn't. In fact, the state allows us an exemption period. Because here's the thing. When you've got classified confidential data and you do things with it, you kill deals. But not only that, sometimes you commit crimes, right? So people got to be careful. Even if they come into possession of something innocuously, uh, if they say they didn't get it purposely, they can be charged with a crime. So I don't, you know, that particular situation was terrible lost good jobs. And that was a sad thing. So I can't tell you everything, but I can tell you ST Aerospace is growing. Navy Federal is growing. Circular Gene is growing. 
Pegasus Labs is growing. We're trying to broaden this employment base so that your kids and your grandkids can stay in Pensacola if they want to. To me, that's a success. Those slides up there, success. 22 out of 356 counties. That's tremendous. That's, that's hard work. And that's why you have so much equity in your home. That's why the jobs and wages are going up and all these other things. All right, Jim Cavanaugh. Will there be, one, a pedestrian walkover? We tried that last year. We didn't get the money. Number two, nine mile entrance to OLF8 or other street entries. There will be an entrance to OLF8 from Nine Mile and from Frank Reader. That's what all the renderings show. Who will pay for electric streets, uh, electricity, uh, I, can't read their, I can't read the handwriting. Uh, Jim Cavanaugh, where's Jim Cavanaugh? Well, I couldn't read your handwriting, man. What, what were you saying? I'm talking about utilities of the, of the company that's in here. Oh, well they're gonna pay. <laughs> they're gonna have meters and they're gonna pay. That's the way, that's the way that we're not, we're certainly not gonna pay for it. They're gonna pay for it. Green spaces for having it be, absolutely there's gonna be green spaces. It's worked into even the compromise plan, it's in there. All right, Teresa Blackwell with the fifth or sixth comment. Okay, here we go. The wildlife management area is a vast, untapped resource for recreation for Beulah, but it is in terrible condition. The roads north of Nine Mile could the county partner with the managers of the wildlife area to bring those roads back to being uh, drivable to the Perdido River. Yeah, I think we could. I think we will. I, I can tell you, kind of off topic a little bit, but it's, it, look, sometimes the state and the county, we can work together really well. I've got Perdido Key in my district. We just found out we have a whole lot of public beaches that have, been, that have been held behind no trespassing signs. So the problem now is parking, right? The real estate out there is so expensive. So how do you get to this mile worth of beaches that's, been, that's had no trespassing signs and people like me have been told, no, you can't. It's but all along there was easements for public beaches. Well, how do you do it? We well, gotta build parking where there's no real estate available. So I called Alex Andrade, the state rep from that district. And I said, Alex, let's work together. You've got the state park right down the street. You've got open area. Let's work on extra parking. We've got a, we've got a multi-use path coming. So you've got to be creative. And so, so Teresa, I'm willing to do that. I'm doing it right now in another part of my district. I'll do it all day long. Michelle Salzman's here. Send her, a, send her an email, too. I'll work with her. I'll put money in, too. That's what I'll do. All right. We've got two more, and then we're going to do audience participation. And it's going to be great. This is my favorite part. Uh, but I've got to get through this one, too. And uh, boy, this is trouble. I understand the desire for jobs in the area. We will reserve enough space for the public use. Yes, we will. Santa Rosa has bands on the beach and the Blackwater. Well, bands on the beach is Escambia County, but yes, I go to it, it's very fun, it's very nice. And bands on the Blackwater, yes, that's good. Downtown has gallery dice. Me and many others are hoping for areas for families to gather for public entertainment, uh, supplemented by local businesses, food trucks and other uh, ventures, live entertainment. I I'm all about it, let's do it. There's gonna be a town center in that plan. Uh, if you've seen the plan, the hybrid plan, there's a town center for it. By the way, Breland's plan, didn't have a town center, but people love the Breland deal. It didn't have a town center. Rick Thomas, what industry or business was planned for that portion of the master plan? What efforts were being uh, made to, to bring these businesses? Well, there's, there's a big effort being made by the Chamber of Commerce, First Place Partners, PEDC, Florida West. It's an all hands on deck evolution because look, every other community in this town, or in, in, this, in the southeast and in, in the country, they're, they're fighting for these good jobs, these good manufacturing jobs. I mean, northern uh, Mississippi's lighting it up, northern Alabama's lighting it up with big manufacturing plants. Those are big wins for those communities. If we get something like that here, it's a big win for us too. And it keeps those numbers, those wage numbers high, which is important. That drives the economy. That allows for the housing value to go up. That allows for us to have equity in our homes and all these other things. Uh, Bob Ahrens, what guarantee do we have that the Board of Commissioners will not change the master plan to benefit D.R. Horton? Well, I'm not gonna change it. I'm not gonna change it, but if there, are, if there are portions of that plan that are not economically viable, then the plan, the plan may be adapted. Even the master planner herself said that. She said these things evolve. They still have to follow the ordinances, though. They still have to follow the ordinances. George Levy, instead of lowering housing, it would be better to have better jobs by having businesses and light industry? Yes, I believe that. What average pay at maybe federal compared to Airbus and Mobile or ST Engineering? I don't have that data. I don't have it. I know they pay very well. Um, uh, you know, and I, they were invited to me. Is there anyone here from Navy Federal? I didn't see Kara. Didn't see anyone. No, no one's here. They, they pay well. Do you work there? She's shaking her head and smiling. They pay, they pay real good with a big bonus on the top too on, in February, so, well, so far as I've been told. All right, Patty says, if it's not on the master plan, can we get a new 
convention center. Oh, convention center, okay. The one downtown is too small. Well, we've been working on that too. We brought, I brought that about three or four times. By the way, the Civic Center, where I graduated from high school, saw my first concert, um, we are studying it right now. We're gonna put some money into that thing. I mean, it's, it's, a great, it's a great thing to have. It needs a lot of work. I mean, people, some people have said, the same guy that didn't like economic development spilled the beans on that other, that guy said we should just tear it down. Crazy, no, no, we need that. I love having a great concert come to town. Elton John came here, I mean, come on, that's cool. We got sports, we got the ice flyers, the pilot. Yeah, it's awesome. Great concerts. Kid Rock was there, it's amazing. All right, why should, why should we have to travel to Mobile? Exactly. I, I had to go to Mobile for New Year's because they didn't do anything here. Guess what, we're gonna do something this year. We're gonna do that Pelican drop again, right? We're gonna do that again. I'm not gonna drive the Mobile again. I'm not gonna do it, I'm gonna spend my money here. Um, you're right, we should. All right, Vicki Adams. I drive from Beulah to downtown Pensacola for work, Monday through Friday. I used to get to the I-10 in five minutes or less. Now it can take 20 minutes. And the ramp going to I-10 is frequently at a dead stop. If more houses are on oil of fate, there will be more accidents. No one should take, no one should have to deal with the stress of a stop and start with frequent accidents on this commute. I know we need to adjust the routes, widen and add lanes. Shouldn't we put lives first and not housing uh, until the infrastructure is complete. It's a great. It's a great point. It's very true. We've grown. Uh, you know, I never wanted any housing there too. I mean, again, I know we need more housing. That's why the supply and demand. That's why the prices are so high. But do they all? Does it all have to be concentrated in one place, or could it be spread out in other areas? That's why concurrency was so powerful. Everyone wants to build next to the best middle school, and elementary school, right? But if you say, hey, look, we're going to charge you, you know, fifteen hundred bucks per unit if you build here, but if you build down here, they have good schools too. It 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 gives them an incentive to move it. It was a great thing. The state took it. The county had it, and then 2013, they took it out. So I, I showed up in office, there was nothing. The one thing we do have, and I will say this, I, I just want to sound like I'm negative. Um, we've got the one penny sales tax. Let me just tell you what, that's, that's an incredible tool. We've funded so many great projects with that. I'm telling you guys, all over town, we got our library in Bellevue. I mean, we're doing projects all over the place. I'm doing a big drainage project, um, you know, uh, Pine Valley Estates, I mean, just all over the county. So thank you for your generosity in, in uh, approving that because we, there's a lot of things we couldn't do if we didn't have that, so thank you. All right, Jerry Giles, a final question. We're gonna to get to audience participation. We're gonna wrap this thing up. Um, I appreciate your support of the master plan. What is there to keep three out of the five commissioners to approve a different plan? Well, to be very, very honest, there's really very little. The board, when they vote as a unit, have a lot of raw power. That's what the attorney tells us. They have a, a tremendous amount of raw power, but I would say this, we've baked it into the codes and the ordinances. It's baked in the elements of the master plan. So, could it happen? Yeah. But it's baked into the ordinances. It would be a time use situation. And of course, there'd be rooms full like this that would probably uh, take offense to it, right? So, um, like I said, I mean, everyone saw the paper. Everyone sees what I'm saying. I, I support the master plan. I support it. The compromise. Um, even though it has elements that I did not support. Okay, I appreciate everyone's patience. Now, uh, do you remember those comment cards that you guys got when you came in? You all still have them? Because this is the part where I get to learn uh, exactly where you guys are on a host of topics that are very, very important to me, and they help me in my decision making. So some of these, if, if, raise your hand if you've ever come to a, one of my town halls before. Okay, so a lot of new people, good. Oh, that's great. All right, would you like more town halls like this more often? Okay, that's, that's unanimous. I apologize, I'm keeping score while we do this, so. <laughs> what, what did you do, Michelle? Did you just okay? All right, all right. Next up, would you attend more frequent town halls? Great. All right, that's that's good stuff. Okay, this one here, guys. I'm going to give you. Let's see. One, two, three, four. Five. Okay, I'm going to think of the next five topics. I'm going to give them to you. Don't put your cards up yet. Just hold your cards down. But I'm gonna give you five topics that I've heard, you know, talking to citizens, talking to constituents that are the most important issues, right? So you can't say everyone's the most important. But here are the issues. Traffic, stormwater, growth of residential development, homelessness, or affordable housing. Again, one more time. These are the, I'm gonna go in order. So think of that in the one that sticks in your craw, the one that you're most upset about. Is it traffic? Is it stormwater? Is it the growth of residential development? Is it the homelessness? or is it affordable, attainable housing, okay? So when you come to the one that is your, your biggest concern, just put up your green card. Now, if I see everyone go up every time, I'm gonna know I didn't do it right. 
I've screwed it up. But remember, there's five issues, so wait till you're a good one. So the biggest issue in this area of District 1 is traffic. That's a big, that's a big number. Probably, she, you can't do two, Michelle. That, no, you can't. All right, so. Uh, yeah. Are you? <laughs> only a few. All right. The biggest issue is stormwater. Okay, that's about 5%, 6%, 6%. All right, the biggest issue in District 1 is the growth of residential development. Boy. You, you can't vote twice. Let's see, you're throwing off my whole, you're skewing my whole deal. Okay, all right, 40. It's got to add, here's the thing, it's, at the end of it, guys, it's got to add to 100, right? I did pay attention in math class. All right, the homelessness issue is this area's biggest problem. Yeah, okay. I'll tell you what, that is, a, it's a vexing problem, so it's probably, okay, so I appreciate that, guys. And, and by the way, it's voluntary to participate. It helps me. I do appreciate you guys uh, uh, helping me with that. All right, do you support property rights? This is an important one, because it's, there's a couple questions back to back. Do you support property rights for owners of private property? Okay, everyone always says yes to this. Okay, that's 100%, that's 100%. I didn't see one, is there anyone, let me put it this, anyone doesn't support property rights for, okay, no, it's 100%. Are, oh, did I? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, affordable housing, is that the number one issue? I jumped right over it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't think, I don't think, uh, I don't think he's, he's part, excuse, excuse me, hey, you're not part of the program, man, all right? Thanks. Yeah, have a good one. Take care. All right. Do you support zoning and ordinances to keep property development orderly in your community? Okay. Some people don't. Okay. There are people that come to the meetings and say, we shouldn't have any zoning. I, sh I should be able to do whatever I want. So I'm glad in this group people understand that that's important. Okay. Will you, okay, this is important. Will you participate in the county's Sigma Consulting's efforts to create a master plan for the entire community? Will you participate? All right, good, all right. I appreciate that, that's important. We gotta have people participate. All right, do you support mixed-use development at OLF8? Mixed-use development at OLF8, do you support it? I do because I signed my name and voted on it. I wanted jobs. All right, I think that sounds, that sounds pretty unanimous to me. Um, would you support this is kind of an off the topic thing because uh, some people have asked since we've grown, would you support ECAT bus service out to Beulah? Would you support that? I mean expanded, I'm sorry, did I say? Disagree. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so that's, I'd say there's some support for that. All right. Do you support the Beulah interchange project that is in the planning stages and will add an additional interstate access point to the Beulah Road area. That's gonna be great. We gotta disagree back in the back, but I'd say it's 99%. That, no, that thing is gonna take, it's gonna take half the traffic off of Nine Mile Road. I mean, imagine when you're over here, you just make the left and you're right there. Half that traffic going down Nine Mile Road is gonna disappear. It's gonna make things a lot better. Um, Vicki, it's gonna make a lot, lot better on your commute um, once it gets built, once it gets built. Um, okay, this is a question. You can tell me if you agree or disagree. I support Navy Federal Credit Union's expansion in Escambia County. Glad to see that. That's, they're, they're, they're an amazing company. I've, I, 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 will, I will say, when I was campaigning door to door in Beulah, both my campaigns, I had several people tell me they, they didn't support Navy Federal and they thought it had ruined Beulah. They've ruined Beulah. And I said, I can't have a rational conversation with you. That It's probably one of the best things that ever happened. Uh, in this area. Okay. Uh, do you support the county pursuing jobs? This is an important one to me. You saw the slides. You saw the stats. Do you support the county pursuing jobs for a Scamby County residents via economic development? Okay. All right. I appreciate that. That's, there's a small minority of people that think that's crazy. Why are you spending money? To, and I'm just like, because we want those numbers. We want to be 22 out of 356. We want equity in our homes. We want our kids to stay when they graduate. That's why. That's why. I support economic development ad valorem tax exemptions. Now, does everyone know what an e-date is? It's, I know it's a mouthful. It's an economic development ad valorem tax exemption, which means a company like Navy Federal, we give them five million. 
$5 million in tax breaks in exchange for certain milestones and benchmarks like creation of jobs, long, longevity. Um, do you support that? Do you support that? Okay, some people don't. I mean, I, that's fine. You look, you can disagree. I'd say the majority do because it's a, it's a smart policy. And, and frankly, if we didn't do it, we wouldn't have a lot of the, <laughs> we wouldn't have what we had because every other community is going to do it, believe me. Um, we're getting close. Oh, this is my favorite. For those of you who have never been to my town hall, this is always my favorite question to ask, my very favorite question to ask. And I want you to be very honest. Again, it's voluntary. You don't have to participate. This is a statement, either agree or disagree. Our local newspaper, the Pensacola News Journal, is in step with our community's values. A sea of red. Can you see that? If it's green from that side, you know, uh, you know what that means from the front side. It's a sea of red. All right. I believe what I read in our local newspaper, the Pensacola News Journal. <laughs> wow. There's a lot of red. A lot of red. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Channel 3. <laughs> I got beat up by the News Journal. They said, well, how come you never ask about Channel 3? So guess what? Equal opportunity. We're going to ask about Channel 3 now. Channel 3, WEAR, covers the news in a fair and balanced manner for our community. I think they do. Well, a lot of people do. <laughs> well, it's about half and half. All right. Okay. Oops. Okay. This is a good one because I like this guy. He runs a great, great paper. I get a lot of my news from NorthEscambia.com. William Reynolds does a great job. If you never looked at NorthEscambia.com, check it out. The guy's incredible. Just the news, no opinions, no pontificating, no bloviating, just the news. I like it. About 60%. All right. I get my news from Facebook or other online sources. It's amazing how many people agree. Okay, good. Most people don't. That's very good. Very good. All right. 20% maybe. I would support having more <laughs> I said this earlier. I kind of gave it away. I would support having more dining and restaurant choices out here in Beulah. Please. Roller hot dogs, spinning burritos, Circle K. Ah. I it was, I'd even take a Starbucks. I mean, I, but I want a full. I mean, really, why do we have to drive? We've, there's enough people out here now. Why do we have to drive down the road, get in our cars? Wouldn't it be great to have like a PF Chang's or something like that, or a Top Golf? How about that? Dave and Buster's. Come on, Dave and Buster's, man. Patrol. Patrol. Well, I like, but that's a drive. I got to drive. I want them here. All right, that's 100 percent. Okay, this is one that's okay. This isn't necessarily applicable to Beulah, but. Beulah people uh, utilize this um, recreational facility. Do you support free public beach access on Perdido Key in District 1? Oh, yeah, everyone does. And by the way, we're opening up a lot more of it, a lot more. We're opening up a lot. A lot of it, a lot of it was supposed to be for public, thank you. A lot of it was supposed to be for public beaches, and these, uh, a lot of people put no trespassing signs, and no one questioned it, and they just, obedient and they didn't do it but uh, I know this when I was a kid growing up there fishing out there with my dad we walked up and down the beaches there was never no trespassing signs it was a public beach we're bringing it back by the way I'm glad you that was hundred percent I think I saw one red but you turned it real quick on me so hundred percent good all right local local offices oh man oh man all right you're gonna love this one local offices such as county commissioners and school board members should be subject to term limits I hate to Follow say it. Session, don't worry. They, she's session. filing it. Okay. All right. Well, there's a part two to this. Okay. So that's like 95%. I, and look, I don't disagree. <laughs> Here you go. National offices like Senate and Congress should be subject to term limits. Yes. 40 years, some of these people. Are, yes. It's unbelievable. 100%. All right. I believe FDOT does good work in the state and in our local area on the roads. They work hard. I mean, they do. I mean, they do they can, what they can with the money. You heard Chris. They, they have challenges with the money. Okay, this is good. But the sheriff had to leave. Um, I would support because I'm going to work to make this happen. If he wants it, I would support a sheriff substation out in Beulah. Okay, I'm working on that, guys, because I know sheriff had mentioned to me he would support that too. All right. Um, this is this is kind of an off the wall question because uh, another area of my district is working uh, towards incorporation. So um, it's going to require a commitment from the, the 
property owners out there uh, to pay more in utility tax bills, use uh, business fees, and ad valorem taxes. So um, uh, this is just a statement. You can agree with it or disagree with it. I would pay more in taxes to incorporate Beulah. I would pay I would pay more in taxes to incorporate Beulah. All right, that's a sea of red, a sea of red. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's that's a, we had a great question up here, and you know, and I'm not speaking to the effort that's going on right now. I don't look. I don't own property down there. If they incorporate, <laughs> in fact, one of them was asking me about it. If they incorporate, that makes my job easier. They can take Perdido Key Drive. They can take Bower Road. Go get them, Tiger, right? They don't want it. They don't want it. They want government light. They want to raise property taxes. They want to raise fees on your utilities. And they want to have five or six guys, but no new schools, no new fire stations, no new police. So I, I would always ask, what, what, if I owned property there, I would ask, what problem are you solving by raising my taxes, my, my, you know, my business taxes, my utility taxes? What, what problem are you going to solve? If you're going to bring more police out, I might, I might be interested. You're going to build some more schools, another fire station. By the way, the fire station right down the road, I just found out, I forgot to mention it, such a big win for Beulah. Yeah. It's going to be done in November. We're going to dedicate that. That's, a, that's going to be a great win for Beulah. It's such an amazing facility. And I got to tell you, how many people know the story? Raise your hand if you know the story about the naming of that fire station. Raise your hand if you know it. Okay, good, good, I'm going to tell it. Steve McNair was, the, was a, fire, a volunteer fireman out there for 50 years. He helped build it. Another young man was a volunteer there for many years. He served in the military. His name was Dwayne Bradshaw. He was an assistant chief out there. Well, unfortunately, um, responding to a call, Chief uh, Bradshaw lost his life in the line of duty. He was helping a motorcycle accident victim, um, and, and sadly, he was, he was killed. So when it came time to build that fire station, which I will tell you was a six-year evolution, I mean, it's, it's just going to be so satisfying when you get it done. It was a lot. I brought it to the board and I said, you know, I want to name it for some, I don't want it to be station two. I don't want it to be station 22, 30. I want it to mean something. So I brought it to the board and we're going to name that thing the Bradshaw McNair Fire Station. I'm so proud to do that. And so I hope that you guys will come to that. Those men, those men were great men. And, uh, and Steve uh, is a great man. And I, I hope he, that he's there with his family um, because that was a unanimous vote of the board. Okay, we're getting down uh, to the wire. I think, um, I think I'm getting toward the end. Okay, so here's the way this is gonna work. Is if there's anyone here that still has a question, raise your hand and I'll walk, I will walk the mic to you. I will walk the mic to you. Hello? I emailed and I spoke with two different postmasters and I said, we've got this field out here. We've got room and we have need. Our, in our neighborhood routinely, I do deliver the mail to the guy down the road and he delivers me, we get the wrong mail all the time. The problem is the post office around the country is contracted out there, closing offices. So they told me it wasn't feasible. The good news is that doesn't mean you can't put a you know a UPS store or something like that over there if the market, if the market needs it. So great question.
both said they would, but then we got the drawing and said, no. And again, remember, you know, I'm not tired of this guy. It was complex. And I didn't say, all right, okay, something else that hasn't been addressed. All right, I see you in the back. I'll, I'll come to you, I promise. And then I'll come back to Teresa. Thank you. She got her big question. Oh, do you need my help? Okay, never mind. Thank you. How is the Wawa station on the corner of the Mountain Mile? That's a very good question. Horace, you got an answer for that one? Drew Homer um, from Development Services is going to come up. That's a good question. Yeah. By the way, how many people have ever been to a Wawa station? They're really, they're kind of nice, actually. So that intersection, up closest to the intersection, there is uplands there. The plans they have submitted to us are just building on the upland areas. As you start you know, going north from there, you know how the road drops, that's where all the wetlands are to the back part. So they've, it's, it's a confined space that they have to build on. But it, it you know, shoved close to the corner is what it's going to be. We're still under review. We're still under review. Um, you know, keep in mind access on those roads, those are DOT roads, so they're going to have to work with them as well. Thank you very much, Drew. And I would say, um, I used to go, <laughs> I used to go to Tom Thumb only, right? But it was the only station there. But when they opened Circle K, I go to Circle K. I mean, I, nothing against Cumberland Farm or whatever they're called now, but or are they still Tom Thumb? I don't know. But Circle K, you, you make a right turn in, you make a right turn out, and you get the left to go back down. I mean, I, to me, I hope we have the same functionality with the Wawa station once they build it. I mean, I, I hope you guys could do something cool like that. I mean, um, make a right and then come right to the light. Okay, uh, and anyone else? Okay, sir, you in the back. Rayleigh right there behind you is going to hand you the mic. So if Mobile Highway is 55 miles per hour through Beulah, and it's a two-lane road, which the gentleman said will support expanding forward that lanes, why is nine miles, which has hardly any, Uh, Chris is going to come answer it because I've had a million people ask me that question, and I'm telling you, it's it always boggles the imagination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an explanation. So anytime you have what is called an urban section, and that is a street that has curb and gutter and sidewalks, the highest the speed limit can be is 45. That's the state standard. That's you know, I, I know that's probably not the answer that you want, but that's the state's their road, and that's that's the explanation for it. We've got time for a couple more. And by the way, who's who's keeping the time on this? Seven forty-nine. Oh, psh, this is perfect. Phil, for you really, you're up. And then, what's the impact on your OL, OLFA project if Portland or Sterling or some of the guys in there, and the money you got from Deepwater Horizon to put the access road? What, what's the question? What happens to the Deepwater Horizon? Oh, we, we spent it at the airport. Remember Navy Federal? Navy Federal gave us the money. Which money? The access roads across OLFA. That, that's Triumph Gulf Coast. That's Triumph money. money. Yeah. That's right, Matt. Triumph money. Well, if, if, if the private sector builds it, then we would be able to use uh, Triumph Gulf Coast money other, other places, other projects. Or we would have to shrink it because the Triumph Gulf, Triumph Gulf Coast grants only work and operate if, if the county or the city or the municipality remains in control of the property. Like at the airport, SC is building these big hangars. The city of Pensacola has a lease agreement with them, so the city controls it for a number of years. They, they won't make it. If, if, so if, if it was a commerce park, we would have got the 29 million. When it becomes housing and hotels, Triumph isn't going to give us the money. So we lost, we lost money there. L luckily, it's worth a lot of money. So that's a good, good question. Very good question. All right, Teresa, you might. Okay. Yes, sir. All the extra growth out here was a school. Yep, you still hear? Oh, there he is. So, uh, my friend Kevin Adams and I had a meeting with uh, a gentleman in our office about the potential of a high school on OLF 8, but I haven't. Oh, yeah, yeah, come on down. You're still here. You're hanging out. Oh, the, uh, <laughs> he's still here. <laughs> the, the, the school district has gave the county commissioners two different letters. One when Michael Thomas was here, one from the recent one that just departed, both for a K-8, okay. okay? So, but me, as one of five, 
I'd rather see a high school in that northwest corner of the airfield. It's my opinion. I need 50 acres. Uh, 50 acres is going to be tough, by the way. Again, I'm talking about 25 maybe. Okay, Teresa, I want to get to have real quick. This man's been waiting very patiently. Yes, sir. I, I had a question about uh, the sewer system. What's in there now? Oh, you want to talk you, You've got all these all this buildings you're going to have here, and we got septic tanks for real. I've got rooms in there. So is the developer going to put in the sewer lines to make it bigger? Or? Yes, I do. The answer no. The answer is the private developer will pay for that. Look, I'm getting ahead of from the staff. John, did you want to? Okay. Vicki wants to answer this gentleman's question. So at ECUA, growth pays for growth, and if the developers uh, are building, they have to pay for the sewer system. Answer that question. Thank you, Vicki. And we do not like something, so if you want to convert, come talk to me. Uh, he, she and I disagree on some things, and that's one of the... My septic tank is great because I pay only for the stuff coming in. If you're on a sewer, you pay for a gallon coming in and then two gallons going out. So my bills are very low. So, and it, you know. Nobody wants it until they have to redo this. Well, I'm never going to have to redo that. I'm never. All right. Who's up? You and then Teresa. Then I have to talk about It's 45 out here, but when the school is in session, no one slows down and no signs do not blink. So people are driving 45 to 65 miles an hour in front of the school. Something needs to be done with the signs. Here, but his deputy, the young man up front, will convey that. I'm sure it was, uh, and I've seen, and I will say this, and you guys have seen it too. The highway patrol have been conducting a lot of exercises out here, a lot of speed. Uh, I don't want to call them speed traps, but they've been out here. I've seen a lot of people get pulled over. In fact, well, I'm not going to say, <laughs> but yeah, a lot of people get pulled over. <laughs> uh, Teresa, you get the last question. Okay, um, this is number eight. I just have like three sentences, but I also. Is it a question or what? Uh, I also spoke with Maria Curry, and what she said is the plan can change if it meets the intent of the master plan as well as the code. And the VR Horton does not, by any means, is what she said. So, but the other thing is, um, I have signs out there. I'm glad to hear the commissioner supports the DPZ master plan because I have signs at the navy blue truck, Nissan Frontier truck, a limited number for as many as would like to put a sign in their yard to support the DPC master plan. They also make good sunshades if you live in a subdivision. Thank you. Hey, I'll take one for a sunshade. Thank you. I'll use it. Can I use it as a fan? All right. Well, guys, it's 8 o'clock on the button. I want to say thank you very much for coming. Uh, I appreciate your participation. Um, if anyone did not get their questions answered, there's my, I'm going to stand right here. I'll talk to anyone face to face. I'll stay until they kick me out. Or you can send me an email or call me. Thank you. Thank you. How many acres is in the development area? 540 is what we have left. All right. Thank you. Rose Black. Except for Gosh.